since 2005, uh, Christoph is a professor in Vienna, Austria. And then before that, he was a professor in Lyon for three years. And he was also one of the organizers of the introductory workshop. And one more thing, I think um, Christian was a special planet before being, and at the time, same time as being a mathematician, so I think it's doing that. So, okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the introduction. So this is supposed to be a tutorial, and um, as was Tony's, and um, Tony told that uh, he had not much briefing. So in my case, it's slightly better. I had some briefing. <clears throat> so I was advised to um, make the first part as an introduction to the fundamental role played by combinatorics in discrete lattice models, and then maybe emphasize models where combinatorial combinatorics techniques have been most successful, and maybe it could serve as introduction to the next workshop as well. So this sounded very reasonable to me. But um, when I started thinking about it, um, I was less sure um, what I should actually do, because um, so to describe the problem, yes, discrete lattice models, and um, <clears throat> That means you have a lattice for a combinatorial list. This is a finite lattice for a physicist. This is an infinite lattice. And then you put your configuration on it, edge configuration maybe, maybe a dimer configuration or vertex configuration, like a spin configuration. And um, it's combinatorial lists, probabilists, and physicists which are interested in that. And you can define the difference by the questions that are asked. So I'm simplifying now a lot. So combinatorialists ask how many or compute the generating function. Then <clears throat> in probability, you are interested in the random object, the large random objects. Which shape does it have? What can you say about structural properties? And in physics, <clears throat> you want to analyze the partition function on infinite lattices, which of course is impossible, so you have to do the limit anyway. <clears throat> and um, as Tony already pointed to, the phase transitions are something which physicists are very interested in. Of course, it's not so sharp here, and there are many overlapping interests, but just to make the point, but then what is a combinatorial method? <clears throat> Again, one thinks that's, that's clear what a combinatorial method is. So let us take a typical combinatorial method like the non-intersecting lattice path method to which I will come back, which um, the first general theorem on this is by Bernd Lindström in 1971. But then, actually, Carlin and McGregor had the same idea somewhat earlier in a probabilistic context. And then physicists will also know that there is this Slater determinant, which also has the same idea sitting inside, although you could not use um, this particular result to derive the non-intersecting lattice path theorem of Lindström, but still, it's the same idea. So is it now a combinatorics method that was stolen from probabilists and uh, physicists? So somewhat confusing, <clears throat> so, but um, if this is too difficult, let's try something simpler. Let's take a typical physics method. The transfer matrix method that was already alluded to in Tony's talk. That's a typical physics method. So you have a lattice and then you put another chunk to it and um, you have a matrix which describes how this is done and how your configurations change when you put another chunk to it. And then you analyze the spectral behavior of this. But um, what does Richard Stanley say in his book, Enumerative Combinatorics 1, the connection between the powers of the adjacency matrix of a digraph and 
counting walks in the digraph is part of the Foucault in graph theory. So this is really what is behind this transfer matrix method. And maybe indeed um, combinatorialists may have been later, but um, he also writes this is essentially the same as the theory of finite Markov chains and that was certainly before. <laughs> So again, is this now a physics method that was stolen from the probabilists? So I'm afraid I have no solution to this problem. And um, for me, it's good enough to say, for me, it's in the eye of the beholder whether this is a combinatorial method or not. In any case, what I'm planning to do is to give you a parade of models where what, in my opinion, is a combinatorial method um, has played a big role, and so let me begin. So what I will also do is that I start with things that are very close to my own research and then move far away so that it becomes, um, over time it becomes more difficult for me. So I start with timer models. So in Daimler models, in the Daimler model, and for my purpose, I will take a planar graph with vertices and edges, and then, I, as you probably all know, a Daimler covering, as the physicists say, perfect matching, as the combinatorialists say, is a subset of the edges such that, so actually, I have an example. Here is. A planar graph, by some chance it's a hexagonal graph, but um, for the moment this is not so important. It's a subset of the edges of this graph such that every vertex is covered exactly once by an edge. So here is such a collection of edges which cover every vertex of the graph exactly once. So this is a dimer covering of this graph. And then <clears throat> what we are interested in is the partition function, as the physicists say, the generating function, as the combinatorialists say, of this model on this graph. So you have to fix this graph and then you now sum over all timer coverings of this graph and then <clears throat> what you also do at the very beginning which I missed to write on the transparency is that each edge comes with a weight a positive real number for the combinatorialists very often it's just a variable but for physicists it's a positive real number and so this W of an edge this is this weight of the edge and then a dimer configuration, the weight of a dimer configuration is then the product over the weights of all the edges. You take the sum and this is the dimer partition function. And what you want to do is, as I stressed at the beginning, uh, depending whether you are combinatorialist, physicist, probabilist, you ask different questions about this partition function. And if you want to answer questions about the partition function, then you need an you need to start with an expression that you can work with because this is just the definition and this is a huge sum. And the very beautiful thing about this model is that you are able to write down an explicit expression. And this is done by the so-called Castellan matrix. And behind this Castellan matrix is the following lemma. If you have a planar graph, then you can orient your edges in such a way that you consider a face. That was stupid, actually. I need this picture again. Okay. So take a face, and what does it say? You travel clockwise around the face and then you are always able to find an orientation of the edges 
such while you are walking around, you meet an odd number of arrows that point towards you in the wrong direction. So here's such an orientation. In the, in the case of a hexagonal graph, it's actually very easy because um, there are three types of edges. And for each type of the edges, you direct all these edges in the same direction. So if you if we travel around here clockwise, we have one, two, three arrows that point in the wrong way. <coughs> Once you have such an orientation, then you can define a corresponding Castellan matrix, which is basically just the adjacency matrix of your graph, except that you tweak the sign a little bit. And how this is done is explained here. So you define this matrix K, X, Y. X, Y are two vertices of the graph. And if uh, the arrow if there's an arrow from x to y, then you just take the weight of this edge. If it's oriented in the other way, then you take minus this weight of the edge. And if there's no edge between the two, then you put a zero. So it's almost the adjacency matrix. And then the famous theorem of Castellan and independently Temple and Fisher says, you take the Pfaffian of this matrix, or equivalently, you take the determinant and the square root of it, then you get this Daimler partition function. And this theorem stands at the beginning of this now famous asymptotic analysis of Kenyon, who was the first to realize that in order to compute correlations in the Daimler model, you should get a hand on the inverse of the Castellan matrix. And then um, there's this breakthrough paper of Cohn, Canyon, Prop, where the Daimler model is um, very carefully analyzed on a weighted um, grid graph with arbitrary shape. And then the generalization in the paper by Kenyon, Oko, Kof, and Sheffield, and of course there are many more papers. And um, Beatrice de Tillier, uh, will, I think, say some more in this direction next week. As many of you know, <clears throat> I like a particular case, um, especially of this Daimler model, which comes in equivalent form as Romo's tilings. Just to briefly explain, you take some region. In this case, it's a hexagon. And you want to tile this region by unit rhombuses. I have an example here. So you see, um, to do this, what you have to do is you have to take two neighboring triangles, put them together into a rhombus. And you want to cover this completely. And indeed, um, this configuration space of rhombus tilings of a hexagon is in bijection with tilings of a hexagonal graph. And to see this, You go to the dual graph of this triangular grid. So in each triangle, I've put a vertex. And then I've connected two vertices if the corresponding triangles are adjacent. And then clearly, so now it's going to be. Mm. 
each rhombus corresponds to an edge in this hexagonal graph. And so you get this correspondence and bijection. So working with diamond graph coverings of a hexagonal graph or rhombus tilings of some region on the triangular grid is the same thing. For Romo's tiling, there, of course, you can also apply the Castellan matrix and then compute the Fafian of the Castellan matrix. But for Romo's tilings, there's also a different method whose name I have already mentioned before, which is the non-intersecting lattice paths method. And let me demonstrate this with this example. So this is a lozenge a rhombus tiling of a hexagon again. But it need not necessarily be a hexagon, and I will say a few more words in a few minutes. So what you do is you place vertices along, say, the left upper side of the hexagon in the centers of the edges. And you do the same at the opposite side. And then you connect these two sets of vertices by paths. And you do it in such a way that you follow the tiling, the rhombus tiling. That means um, from one vertex, in the center of an edge, you move to the opposite um, center of the edge, and so on. That is, you follow here, then here the orientation changes, and so on. OK. Then I can forget about the tiling. And what remains is a set of paths which obviously have the property that they don't have any common points. And this is what is meant by non-intersecting, although the name is a little bit maybe confusing, but this is the name that stuck at some point. <coughs> so this is um, slightly tilted. So let's make this let's deform the picture slightly to have uh, right angles, rectangular paths, which I then can put on a grid. And so now indeed, if I want to, say, just count the number of rhombus tilings of this hexagon, then I have transformed the problem into counting the number of families of non-intersecting lattice paths connecting these starting points. Let's say the AIs to the endpoints, the EIs. And for this situation, you have given starting points, given endpoints, how many non intersecting Lattice paths are there connecting the starting with the endpoints. There is this theorem of Lindström that I mentioned before. And what I show here is actually just a special case. It's just formulated for um, plain enumeration, but there's also a weighted version. You can have edge weights, vertex weights, whatever you would like. In any case, the theorem of Lindström says if you have a directed acyclic graph, the directed acyclic graph in this situation is the grid graph with edges directed to the right and um, to the bottom. You have some starting points, you have some endpoints, and then there is a technical condition on the starting and endpoints. They have to be compatible in a certain way, and they are in this case they are compatible. And then the number of families of non-intersecting paths in this directed graph 
where the ith path connects the ith starting point to the ith endpoint is given by a determinant. This determinant here. Um, that's not important. Yes. Uh, let me see. No. Um, yeah, this is part of no, no. This is this is part of the technical condition, really. No, indeed. So it's it's it's, it's correct as I formulated. The technical condition is that um, if you have two starting points, two endpoints, and you connect in the wrong order, then there must be an intersection in between. But this is not part of the graph. But this is part of the location of the starting and end point. Any case, so you get this determinant and the ij entry of the determinant is the number of paths from the ith starting point to the jth end point. And the point of this formula is that this is just counting one path. There is no interaction with anything else. So in, for example, in this situation you can write a closed form expression here, in this case a binomial coefficient. And then everything boils down to computing a certain determinant. And in this case, this is really not difficult. In other cases, it may be more difficult. <coughs> right. So there may be more complicated situations. And so I briefly want to indicate that there is not only this theorem here. For fixed starting points, fixed endpoints, there are also theorems covering other situations. So, for example, in recent work with Mihai Chukwu, we wanted to compute the rhombus tilings of a half hexagon in the following sense. We had um, a little hole inside, and then for us it was not important, so there will be some rhombi sticking out of this um, cut, um, cut line where you cut the hexagon into half. And the location of these points, uh, sorry, of these rhombi, rhombi where they are located, that was not important to us. So then again, you can do non-intersecting lattice paths and to not making it too boring. Now the orientation of the path that I have chosen is different. Again, I deform the picture and get this here. So now the situation is more complicated. As I said, for us the, so this was like, this was a free boundary as we call it. So the location of these rhombi was not important, which means that The location of the endpoints was variable. It, um, you can take any, for the endpoints, you can take any points along this line. The starting points located over here, they are fixed. And then there is this hole in the center. And so to, to model the hole over here, I have to demand that these two be fixed endpoints. They must be endpoints. I cannot make a selection. So this is a mixed case. You have some endpoints where you have a choice, and you have some endpoints where you want them to be endpoints. <coughs> and even for that situation, there's a theorem, which I will just flash because um, it's slightly complicated. This is just the first page of, and then the second page explains what this is about, but um, forget uh, what is important here. The enumeration, and also weighted enumeration if you wish, can be done by a Puffian. And again, a Puffian is basically a determinant. It's a square root of a determinant. And therefore, the problem again boils down to computing a certain determinant. So if you know how to compute determinants, then in the end, 
you find that the number of rhombus tilings of this half hexagon with this hole is given by one of these wonderfully complicated formulas. This is, I think, what Jim Prop said once. <coughs> and um, you can use this as a starting point for an asymptotic analysis. So how I'm doing with time, actually quite good. Yes, you, you could take this, reflect it, put it together, and then you can rephrase the whole thing as you want to compute the rhombus tilings of a complete hexagon, which are symmetric with respect to the central line, and where you also have a triangular hole here and on the other side as well. Okay, and then concerning Timer model, I want to mention one more combinatorial technique, which is the matching factorization theorem of Mihai Chuku. It applies to symmetric graphs. What is a symmetric graph? A symmetric graph is a graph which has a symmetry axis. So this one, you see the, the upper half. Right, so I should say at this point that you should forget about AB, about the one half. And um, also these dotted edges, they are edges at the moment. And then you can see that the upper half is just a mirror image of the lower half of this graph. And so this is a symmetric graph. It, what I also want is that this graph is planar and bipartite. Right, and there's another condition. If I delete the vertices along this symmetry axis, then the graph should decompose. So now, Mihai Chuku defines a certain rule how to decompose this graph. And this works as follows. First of all, uh, you walk along the vertices from left to right, and you label them A, B, A, B, A, B, as long as you have to go. It's easy to see that the number of vertices on this um, symmetry axis must be even. If it would be odd, then there is no perfect matching, no dimer covering. So this is not an interesting case. And then I said it's a bipartite graph. So there is a bicoloring of the vertices of the graph. And this is what is indicated here only for the vertices along the symmetry axis. So this is a white vertex, black, white, black, white, black. Uh, that was very complicated. White, black, white, and so on. And then the rule is <coughs> you cut edges above white A's, above black B's. So white A's, you cut above black B's, you cut above here as well, here as well. And then you have the complementary rule and you cut edges below black A's and white B's. So there's no white B, but there's a black A where the edges are cut. And this defines you, so after you have now removed these edges, this defines you two graphs, G plus, G minus, and there's another technical issue, namely you may have edges along the symmetry axis, and for these edges you have to divide the weight by two. Okay, and so now you take this G plus, G minus, and then this fantastic theorem of Chuku says the, so this M of G, this is the Daima partition function of the graph. 
is equal to some power of 2 times the Daimler partition functions of these two copies, g plus, g minus. These two halves, g plus, g minus. And the proof is also bijective. It's a bijective proof. The L of g, this is half the number of vertices along the symmetry axis. In this case, the L of g is 3. So what's the <coughs> point of this theorem? The point of this theorem is that um, if you have some symmetric graph, it may be difficult to compute the timer partition function directly, but after you have applied the theorem, you have cut it in two halves, and it may happen that the two halves can be treated in a much simpler way. And this is indeed the case. There are many applications of this, <coughs> and one of these is... So this is very schematical now. So now I, can, I move again to rhombus tilings of regions. And the region that Mihai Chuku takes is a big hexagon. So you have to imagine that this is covered by a triangular grid. You take some triangles um, out, which are located along the symmetry axis of this hexagon. So this forms. And there's also a certain rule how you are, um, are allowed to choose these triangles, but I skip this. If you want to, for example, you can say, okay, I, this is um, rhombus tilings. I apply the non-intersecting lattice path method. The problem is that this technical condition is violated, so it doesn't work. And besides that, um, you get very complicated determinants. So this is not a good idea. But what he does is he applies, right, so at this point we should again remember that rhombus tilings is equivalent to timer coverings of hexagonal graphs. You can convert this into the problem of computing the timer partition function of the dual graph essentially. And then the matching factorization applies. You can convert, so then you get um, two halves. You can convert this back into a rhombus tiling problem. And now you can apply the non-intersecting lattice path method without any problem. The determinants are still very complicated. But he manages to compute these determinants and gets a closed form formula for this case. And out of this closed form formula, he does an asymptotic analysis, and he shows that um, certain correlations, he defines a certain correlation for the holes here, and he shows that they behave in certain scaling limit like Coulomb's law of electrostatics. And if I'm not mistaken, next week he will discuss another instance of this phenomenon, but not for rhombus tilings, but for diamond coverings on the square grid. And I think also that the, for the counting formula, this matching factorization theorem is of importance. Any questions so far? In this case, um, yes. Uh, let me see if I am able to. Yeah, that's true. One, so in, in one of the half graphs, you have weights of one half for these edges. But, but it's, not, it's, not, it's not a big problem. Yes? The M of G? No, no, this is. Uh, no, actually, he's, he's interested in counting only. So that means every edge has weight 1. Then he applies the matching factorization theorem. And then one of the two graphs will have edges along the, the former symmetry axis with weight 1 half. Another question? Because I move <coughs> now to a 
different family of models. Full effect loop configurations, alternate design matrices, six vertex model. So a full effect loop configuration on some graph. And again, I will just consider planar graphs and actually grid graphs and actually square grid graphs is a collection of edges such that each vertex lies on exactly two edges. So it is a loop model in the sense of Tony. He talked about a loop model. The difference here is that it Every vertex, we want two edges, whereas Tony was allowed zero edges at some vertices. And this is what fully packed refers to. So here is the grid graph that I want to consider. And here's an example of such a fully packed loop configuration. It's not really complete. <coughs> it is not complete along the boundary. And at the boundary, I want a very specific selection of edges. So now you can see that at every vertex there are exactly two edges. It's called loop configurations because you will have some loops. But of course, um, because of the boundary, there will also be other things like this. There will also be paths. But for physicists, this is still loops. And right, so that's it. <clears throat> Sure, yes, but at the moment it's not loops. <laughs> so the specific boundary condition, selection of the boundary edges is that I take every other edge. That means I take this, this not, 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 and this, and so on. <clears throat> so this is a physics model. Why are combinatorialists interested in this? Because it turns out that this type of full effect loop configurations, that means on this square grid with these special boundary conditions, are in bijection with alternating sign matrices, which have occupied combinatorialists a lot in the past. And therefore, they are counted by these famous numbers, these alternating sign matrix numbers. So in case you have not heard about alternating sign matrices, um, I think I don't have an official de definition. Alternating sign matrices are square matrices with entries 0, 1, minus 1 with the rule that along every each row and column ones and minus ones alternate. And the row sums and the column sums are one. So here's an example. We 
can see um, along every column, one minus the ones and minus ones alternates. If you forget about the zeros, one minus one, one. I don't know in the long rows, one minus one, one. Okay. The bijection between these objects and these objects is actually quite simple. Here's the rule. Um, what you have to start with is that you have to mark every other vertex. What I mean is this. Um, here you see I've marked certain vertices and it's every other. So the, so the neighbors are there's a marked vertex, the neighbors are not marked, and then the neighbors of the not marked, they are marked, and so on. In a checkerboard like fashion. And then for these vertices, so uh, I'm not sure whether I have chosen the right convention. We shall see in a moment. I don't think so. Pardon me? Either this is true. Pardon me? No, but this is uh, somewhat strange. Um, yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. I think it doesn't get better. That's strange. Worked once. Maybe I've turned, probably I've turned the picture at some point. <coughs> okay, so for the marked edges, if you see, I mean, it really depends. You can have several conventions. The convention that I've put here it doesn't seem to be in correspondence to my example. So if you have this configuration, you, all right, um, sorry, thank you very much. <laughs> I can still decide what is odd and what is even, and I decide that the marked ones, they are odd. And then if I have this configuration, I put a one if this is even, and if I have this configuration, I do it in the other way around, and if I have a bend at this vertex, I put zeros. And I believe that so if I put this on this, it makes no sense. Uh, I believe that this is in correspondence with this configuration here. <clears throat> and these objects are also in very simple bijection with six vertex configurations. So to explain this, so remember, Tony discussed the six vertex model. At each vertex, there should be two arrows going in and two arrows going out. And what I want is that on the upper side, all arrows are pointing up. On the, along the lower side, all arrows are pointing down. And to the left, left and right, the arrows are pointing in. <clears throat> and so again, you do such a checkerboard marking of the vertices. And then the rule is, at these marked vertices, <clears throat> does it say you um, just keep the incoming edges? Which I have done here, and you can see that you get, barely see that you get a full effect loop configuration. And it's not difficult to see that this is a bijection. So alternating sign matrices, full effect loop configuration with these boundary conditions, um, six vertex model with, this is called domain wall boundary conditions, are all the same. <clears throat> right, what did I want? 
But with the full effect loop configurations, you can ask more refined questions than you can ask with six vertex or alternating sign matrices. And this is what I want to come to next, which is that every full effect loop configuration defines a matching of these pending edges by following the configuration. For example, this edge here, I follow the configuration, is matched with this edge. This edge here is matched with this edge, this is matched with this one, this edge is matched with this one. And so you can ask the question, how many configurations are there for a certain matching pattern? If you fix a matching pattern, how many configurations are there? This is a refined question. I will come back to that. <clears throat> so much of the work on full effect loop configurations in this area in the past about 10 years um, is motivated by a con very fascinating conjecture by Razumov and Stroganov, and I want to explain this conjecture now. So explaining the Razumov-Stroganov conjecture, I have to introduce another model, the dense ovon loop model. <coughs> on a semi-infinite cylinder. So this is supposed to be a cylinder and it's infinite up. Whereas here, it's finished. And then I have these little squares, plaquettes, and uh, into these squares I am allowed to put either this configuration or this configuration. One of the two. At random. So here is a complete configuration. Okay. So it's infinite in this direction. And again, um, the ends here, they are matched because um, you start here and then you follow this loop and it comes back at some point. Actually, it's, um, well, you may say, but it may continue up to infinity. Yes, but the probability that this happens is zero. So for, so with probability one, you come back. And so you can talk about the probability of configurations which have a fixed matching pattern. Again, the same thing. And the fascinating conjecture by Razumov and Stroganov is The probability that a fixed matching pattern occurs in this model here is essentially counting fully packed loop configurations corresponding to this matching pattern. Of course, since this is a probability, you have to normalize by the total number of fully packed loop configurations, which is this famous alternating sign matrix number. This is very fascinating because um, you have here a model. Um, in some sense, you ask for probabilities for configurations arranged along a circle. And in particular, if you take a matching pattern and you rotate it, then obviously the probability must be the same. But um, that means that the number of full effect loop configurations should also be the same when you rotate the matching pattern along the boundary, and this is not obvious at all because um, the square is not symmetric under these little rotations. But in fact, um, an earlier theorem of Wieland said that this is indeed the case. So this was, this was consistent with this theorem. So here it is. So you ask the question, you take 
fully packed loop configurations with a fixed matching pattern. And I indicate um, this matching pattern with these uh, bonds. <clears throat> and what I do from this picture to this picture is that I rotate, I rotate this bonds by uh, one unit. Here I have an example for a fully packed loop configuration satisfying this matching pattern. And here is one for the other. And the theorem says there's the same number. The beautiful thing is that the proof is bijective. There's a very simple rule how to go from here to there. And here it is. Whenever, so what you do essentially is you, you look at every other square. Again, this every other is important. So for me, I point to this square, to this one, to this one, to this one, checkerboard fashion again. And then for these marked squares, you do complementation except when you have two parallel edges. When you have two parallel edges, you keep them in place. So for example, here, from here to here, you see I have done this complementation. Here, I have two parallel edges. They stay the same and so on. And um, although it's not obvious at all, this is indeed a bijection and the pattern rotates. Now the Razumov Stroganov conjecture is solved, is proven by two physicists. And what they do is pure combinatorics. They take exactly this idea, but um, strengthen it um, quite a bit so that it gives a proof of the recurrence relations for these fully packed loop configuration numbers that you have to prove to prove the this Razumov Stroganov conjecture. And I believe that Andreas Porcello, who did this proof with Luigi Cantini, will talk about this next week. So I have at most five minutes left in which I will come to my last topic. Which is map models. A map is a, graph, a connected graph embedded for me just in, in the plane. You can also consider maps on other surfaces. For me, it's on the plane without crossing edges. And here's an example. And what one always does is one wants to break symmetry. And therefore, one of the edges along the outer face is marked, this one here. And it's also oriented so that the infinite face lies on the right. So this is a map. And then what is a map model? You want to compute, you consider a certain class of maps. And then you want to compute the partition function. And the partition function is the sum over all maps. Um, of certain weights of the maps. You can have weights that take into account um, degrees of vertices, degrees of faces, things like this. I will not be very specific about that because it's not so important for my purpose. A very, very brief history of map enumeration. Map enumeration started with the work of Bill Tutt and Brown in the 1960s. And in particular, they developed a very efficient recursive method to which one could apply the so-called quadratic method. And they have found many beautiful results. Then in physics, in the 1970s, there were several people uh, realizing that when one considered matrix models, one could produce generating functions for maps. And so there was 
quite a bit of activity on these matrix models and how to get results for map models. And um, what I want to emphasize is that a little bit more than 10 years ago, Shil Schaeffer came up with very beautiful bijections, which uh, translated uh, the problem of map enumeration to the problem of counting certain trees. And the point here is that maps are, can be very complicated, whereas trees have very simple decompositions, and so they are much <coughs> easier to access by um, generating function methods in particular. So, Schill Schaeffer came up with two fundamental bijections, one of which was actually already found earlier by Corrie and Vauquelin in a different fashion. Since the time is almost up, I have just time for one bijection, which will be a bijection between maps and what Schaeffer calls blossom trees. So here is again a map. As it happens, it's a quadrangulation, which means that every face is, has size four, has four vertices. Pardon me? Uh, sorry, that's wrong. Um, this every vertex degree is four. Thank you. <coughs> so you, we take a map and we want to construct a tree. Here's the rule, we cut the root edge, this edge, thereby we get this, so here it is cut. And then walk around, move around the map counterclockwise, and whenever you meet an edge which you can cut without disconnecting the picture, you cut. So for example, so, and you start at this former root edge, you walk around, um, so we have cut this, so next we meet this edge here, we cut this. And uh, what am I doing? Oh, sorry, no, so I don't have the right order. So again, we start here, this is the first edge we meet, we cut it. And what we do is that the um, origin, of the where the edge starts, we make this blossom, edge with a blossom, and the other is just an edge, and we think that there's a leaf. And we continue this process. Next, I meet this edge here. I cut it, a blossom here, ordinary leaf here. Next, I meet this edge, I cut it, We continue, we meet this edge. If I would cut this edge, then I would disconnect the map. So I am not allowed to do anything. Then we meet this one, we would disconnect. So I have to continue, continue, continue until I meet this edge and this can be cut. And so what do we get? Well, we get a tree, in this case, a binary tree in the sense that we have for every vertex, we have two ordinary edges going out, and in addition, we are allowed to place a blossom. <coughs> so the time is up, and therefore I will not show the inverse map, but there is a closing procedure. Essentially, again, you walk around, and whenever there's a blossom and a leaf immediately following each other, you connect back, and you do this by going around until everything is closed. So then, this defines, uh, in this, what I have shown, this defines a bijection between quadrangulations and so-called balanced blossom trees, and there are many generalizations and variations now around, and they led to bijective proofs for numerous results that Tut had and Brown had proved earlier.
but um, the point really is that generating functions now apply really beautifully to find algebraic equations for the partition function of these. And so the time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. Configurations, alternating sign matrices, six vertex model. So a fully packed loop configuration on some graph. And again, I will just consider planar graphs and actually grid graphs and actually square grid graphs is a collection of edges such that each vertex lies on exactly two edges. So it is a loop model in the sense of Tony. He talked about a loop model. The difference here is that at every vertex we want two edges, whereas Tony also allowed zero edges at some vertices. And this is what fully packed refers to. So here is the grid graph that I want to consider. <clears throat> and here's an example of such a fully packed loop configuration. It's not really complete. <coughs> it is not complete along the boundary. And at the boundary, I want a very specific selection of edges. So now you can see that at every vertex, there are exactly two edges. It's called loop configurations because you will have some loops. But of course, um, because of the boundary, there will also be other things like this. There will also be paths. But for physicists, this is still loops. Uh, right, so that's it. <clears throat> Sure, yes, but at, at the moment it's not loops. <laughs> so the specific boundary condition, selection of the boundary edges, is that I take every other edge. That means I take this, this not, 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 and this, and so on. <clears throat> so this is a physics model. Why are combinatorialists interested in this? Because it turns out that this type of fully packed loop configurations, that means on this square grid with these special boundary conditions, are in bijection with alternating sign matrices, which have occupied combinatorialists a lot in the past. And therefore, they are counted by these famous numbers, these alternating sign matrix numbers. So in case you have not heard about alternating sign matrices, um, I think I don't have an official de definition. Alternating sign matrices are square matrices with entries 0, 1, minus 1 with the rule that along every each row and column ones and minus ones alternate. And the row sums and the column sums are one.
So here's an example. So you can see um, along every column, one minus the ones and minus ones alternates. If you forget about the zeros, one minus one, one. I don't know in the long rows, one minus one, one. Okay. The bijection between these objects and these objects is actually quite simple. Here's the rule. Um, what you have to start with is that you have to mark every other vertex. What I mean is this. Here you see I've marked certain vertices, and it's every other. So the, so the neighbors, are, there's a marked vertex, the neighbors are not marked, and then the neighbors of the not marked, they are marked, and so on. In a checkerboard-like fashion. And then for these vertices, so uh, I'm not sure whether I have chosen the right convention. We shall see in a moment. I don't think so. Pardon me? Either this is true. Pardon me? No, but this is somewhat strange. Um, yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. I think it doesn't get better. That's strange. Worked once. Maybe I've turned, probably I've turned the picture at some point. <coughs> okay, so for the marked edges, if you see, I mean, it really depends. You can have several conventions. The convention that I've put here it doesn't seem to be in correspondence to my example. So if you have this configuration, you, all right, um, sorry, thank you very much. <laughs> I can still decide what is odd and what is even, and I decide that the marked ones, they are odd. And then if I have this configuration, I put a one if this is even, and if I have this configuration, I do it in the other way around, and if I have a bend at this vertex, I put zeros. And I believe that so if I put this on this, it makes no sense. Uh, I believe that this is in correspondence with this configuration here. <clears throat> and these objects are also in very simple bijection with six vertex configurations. So to explain this, so remember, Tony discussed the six vertex model. At each vertex, there should be two arrows going in and two arrows going out. And what I want is that on the upper side, all arrows are pointing up. On the, along the lower side, all arrows are pointing down. And to the ref, left and right, the arrows are pointing in. <clears throat> and so again, you do such a checkerboard marking of the vertices. And then the rule is, at these marked vertices, <clears throat> does it say you um, just keep the incoming edges? Which I have done here, and you can see that you get, barely see that you get a full effect loop configuration. And it's not difficult to see that this is a bijection. So alternating sign matrices, full effect loop configuration with these boundary conditions, um, six vertex model with, this is called domain wall boundary conditions, are all the same. 
<coughs> right, what did I want? But with the full effect loop configurations, you can ask more refined questions than you can ask with six vertex or alternating sign matrices. And this is what I want to come to next, which is that every full effect loop configuration defines a matching of these pending edges by following the configuration. For example, this edge here, I follow the configuration, is matched with this edge. This edge here is matched with this edge. This is matched with this one. This edge is matched with this one. And so you can ask the question, how many configurations are there for a certain matching pattern? If you fix a matching pattern, how many configurations are there? This is a refined question. I will come back to that. <clears throat> so much of the work on full effect loop configurations in this area in the past about 10 years um, is motivated by a con very fascinating conjecture by Rasimov and Stroganov, and I want to explain this conjecture now. So explaining the Rasimov-Stroganov conjecture, I have to introduce another model, the dense O1 loop model. <coughs> on a semi-infinite cylinder. So this is supposed to be a cylinder and it's infinite up. Whereas here, it's finished. And then I have these little squares, plaquettes, and uh, into these squares I'm allowed to put either this configuration or this configuration. One of the two. At random. So here is a complete configuration. Okay. So it's infinite in this direction. And again, um, the ends here, they are matched because um, you start here and then you follow this loop and it comes back at some point. Actually, it's, um, well, you may say, but it may continue up to infinity. Yes, but the probability that this happens is zero. So for, so with probability one, you come back. And so you can talk about the probability of configurations which have a fixed matching pattern, again, the same thing. And the fascinating conjecture by Razumov and Stroganov is the probability that a fixed matching pattern occurs in this model here is essentially counting full effect loop configurations corresponding to this matching pattern. Of course, if this is a probability, you have to normalize by the total number of full effect loop configurations, which is this famous alternating sign matrix number. This is very fascinating because um, you have here a model. Um, in some sense, you ask for probabilities for configurations arranged along a circle. And in particular, if you take a matching pattern and you rotate it, then obviously the probability must be the same. But um, that means that the number of fully packed loop configurations should also be the same when you rotate the matching pattern along the boundary, and this is not obvious at all because um, the square is not symmetric under these little rotations. But in fact, um, an earlier theorem of Wieland said that this is indeed the case. So this was, this was consistent with this theorem. 
So here it is. So you ask the question, you take fully packed loop configurations with a fixed matching pattern and I indicate uh, this matching pattern with these uh, bonds. <clears throat> and what I do from this picture to this picture is that I rotate, I rotate these bonds by uh, one unit. Here I have an example for a fully packed loop configuration satisfying this matching pattern. And here is one for the other. And the theorem says there's the same number. The beautiful thing is that the proof is bijective. There's a very simple rule how to go from here to there. And here it is. Whenever, so what you do essentially is you, you look at every other square. Again, this every other is important. So for me, I point to this square, to this one, to this one, to this one, checkerboard fashion again. And then for these marked squares, you do complementation, except when you have two parallel edges, when you have two parallel edges, you keep them in place. So for example, here, from here to here, you see I have done this complementation. Here, I have two parallel edges. They stay the same and so on. And um, although it's not obvious at all, this is indeed a bijection and the pattern rotates. Now the rasmus troganov conjecture is solved, is proven by two physicists. And what they do is pure combinatorics. They take exactly this idea, but um, strengthen it um, quite a bit so that it gives a proof of the recurrence relations for these fully packed loop configuration numbers that you have to prove to prove the, this rasmus troganov conjecture. And I believe that Andreas Porcello, who did this proof with Luigi Cantini, will talk about this next week. So I have at most five minutes left in which I will come to my last topic. Which is map models. A map is a, graph, a connected graph embedded for me just in, in the plane. You can also consider maps on other surfaces. For me, it's on the plane without crossing edges. And here's an example. And what one always does is one wants to break symmetry. And therefore, one of the edges along the outer face is marked, this one here. And it's also oriented so that the infinite face lies on the right. So this is a map. And then what is a map model? You want to compute, you consider a certain class of maps, and then you want to compute the partition function. And the partition function is the sum over all maps. Um, of certain weights of the maps. You can have weights that take into account um, degrees of vertices, degrees of faces, things like this. I will not be very specific about that because it's not so important for my purpose. A very, very brief history of map enumeration. Map enumeration started with the work of Bill Tutt and Brown in the 1960s. And in particular, they developed a very efficient recursive method to which one could apply the so-called quadratic method. And they have found many beautiful results. Then in physics, in the 1970s, there were several people um, realizing that when one considered matrix models, one could produce generating functions for maps. 
And so there was quite a bit of activity on these matrix models and how to get results for map models. And um, what I want to emphasize is that a little bit more than 10 years ago, Shil Sheffer came up with very beautiful bijections, which uh, translated uh, the problem of map enumeration to the problem of counting certain trees. And the point here is that maps are, can be very complicated, whereas trees have very simple decompositions, and so they are much <coughs> easier to access by um, generating function methods in particular. So Schill Schaeffer came up with two fundamental bijections, one of which was actually already found earlier by Corrie and Ockelin in a different fashion. Since the time is almost up, I have just time for one bijection. which will be a bijection between maps and what Schaeffer calls blossom trees. So here is again a map. As it happens, it's a quadrangulation, which means that every face is, has size four, has four vertices. Pardon me? Uh, sorry, that's wrong. Um, this every vertex degree is four. Thank you. <coughs> so you, we take a map and we want to construct a tree. Here's the rule. We cut the root edge, this edge, whereby we get this. So here it is cut. And then walk around, move around the map counterclockwise and whenever you meet an edge which you can cut without disconnecting the picture, you cut. So for example, so, and you start at this former root edge, you walk around, um, so we have cut this, so next we meet this edge here, we cut this. And uh, what am I doing? Oh, sorry, no, so I don't have the right order. So again, we start here. This is the first edge we meet. We cut it. And what we do is that the um, origin of where the edge starts, we make this blossom, edge with a blossom, and the other is just an edge and we think that there's a leaf. And we continue this process. Next I meet this edge here. I cut it, a blossom here, ordinary leaf here. Next I meet this edge, I cut it. We continue, we meet this edge. If I would cut this edge, then I would disconnect the map. So I am not allowed to do anything. Then we meet this one, we would disconnect. So I have to continue, continue, continue until I meet this edge and this can be cut. And so what do we get? Well, we get a tree. In this case, a binary tree in the sense that we have, for every vertex, we have two ordinary edges going out. And in addition, we are allowed to place a blossom. <coughs> so the time is up. And therefore, I will not show the inverse map. But there is a closing procedure. Essentially, again, you walk around, and whenever there's a blossom and a leaf immediately following each other, you connect back. And you do this by going around until everything is closed. So then, this defines, uh, in this, what I have shown, this defines a bijection between quadrangulations and so-called balanced blossom trees. And there are many generalizations and variations now around. And 
they led to bijective proofs for numerous results that Tut had and Brown had proved earlier. But um, the point really is that generating functions now apply really beautifully to find algebraic equations for the partition function of these. And so the time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>